In today's TMS talk, Rangan Chatterjee shares with Dr. Schubiner his story of healing from chronic back pain. As you listen to this story, I want you to keep in mind something that Rangan touches on as he shares his story. You do not have to buy into the limiting belief systems thrust upon you by the society and culture in which you live. For Rangan, this was the lie that all tall people just have to deal with back pain. He knew better than to buy into this negative belief system. Each of us can ask ourselves what this lie is in our own situation and decide to cancel it. Okay, stick around for after the talk where I will clarify and elaborate on a few concepts. Satya, mind, body, spirit, health, and healing. Now, Hada, what if I might share with you my own journey with, through, and now beyond chronic pain? Because I think perhaps if you hear that, you might be able to explain various bits along the way. Would that be okay? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So I'm now in my early 40s. Okay, so... Really, you look much older. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to say younger, but then somehow <laughs> it's good. You just to make like a joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, when I was um, again, because I really feel it's a thing of the past for me. That it's hard now to remember step by step what happened. But let me share with you some of the key things. So I've always been, I've always been pretty fit and active, and I think it was in the final year of medical school that I was helping my flatmate at the time move into a new flat that we were all going to move into. And all afternoon, I was lifting heavy boxes out of a car, uh, probably with appalling lifting techniques. I knew nothing about it at the time. I never had a problem with my back or anything, so I wasn't thinking. And at one point during the afternoon, I remember getting something out, uh, out of the back. I had a sharp pain in my lower right back, drops everything and I just went onto the floor that's the first time to my uh, recollection now at least that I experienced back pain now that led to maybe a 10 year history where the quality of my life was hugely affected I started off against the doctor Yes, the university doctor, I went to... But, but what happened at the, immediately? So you fell down, you had this acute pain, right? Yeah. And then did you keep... Did you get up and finish the work or did you have to stop for the day? And what happened in the next two or three days, if you recall? Honestly, I cannot remember with, with, with any degree of accuracy. Um, I probably would have stopped. I may have sat down for a while. I may have rested. Maybe I helped get the remainder of the boxes up. I don't really know. But all I remember now, at least, is that I went on a journey for several years where I would take painkillers. I would go and see a physio. You know, I remember I got referred to a physio. I think I paid privately for loads of physio sessions, limited use. Again, I'm not here to have a go at physiotherapy. I'm just saying for me, it was... You know, I was doing some strengthening exercises. But was the pain coming and going? Was it turning on? Was it turning off? Was it there constantly? I, think they... it, I don't think it was there all the time. Yeah. Uh, I think I would just have an awareness of it. If I sat down for too long, I think I'd feel it. Um, at some point in that journey, I think, I don't know when that was. It was probably, I don't know, something like... 1999, 2000, something like that. I moved back to uh, the northwest of England from, from Edinburgh in 2003 to help look after my dad. And I was having real problems. Like I was I was a junior doctor at the time. I was really struggling sometimes with the long ward rounds and my back was really bothering me. I had to take time off. And I think I, I once went to my GP and they referred me for an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. Or I actually think it was at the hospital I worked. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got an MRI scan there. And this is the first time, and I, and I give the, the spinal surgeon who had the consultation with me a huge amount of credit for this. This would have been back around 2003, 2004. There was a disc abnormality on my MRI scan, and I would have been, you know, in my mid 20s, something like that. And he said to me, Yes, you have a disc abnormality, L4, L5. But you've got to understand that I could take 100 people off the street and your age, do an MRI scan on them, 
a lot of them would have the same scan issue and most of them would have no pain at all. So to be fair to him, back then, he was basically saying, this is a static scan. This simply cannot tell me if you have the pain. So I've got other things to share, but any comments so far? Yeah. Well, first of all, the data of these MRIs being abnormal in normal people goes back to the 1980s. So it's not really all that new. We've com it's been compiling over the years. But the thing is, is that what happened at that initial moment? You might have twisted your back. You might have had a back injury due to lifting improperly or whatever. Or your brain might have said, you know, it's been a long day, Rangan. <laughs> You've been working really hard. Maybe this guy's not really appreciative. <laughs> Maybe he's got too many boxes. Maybe they're too heavy. You know, there's a certain amount of stress going on and your brain might have said, time out, you know, you got to stop doing this. And it, your brain can't talk to you. It doesn't speak English. It can only speak in some kind of message. So it might have sent a pain. So in either case, the point is, is you had pain in your lower back at that moment. And then you did the appropriate thing. You rested uh, and then you didn't stress out about it too much and you didn't use your body too much. But then you gradually started to get back into action. And if it was an injury, it had healed. It all because all injuries heal. And so if it's an injury, it healed, and then you would be fine. Unless the neural circuit for that pain continued. And what causes a neural circuit for pain to become chronic or to continue? It's that memory of it. It's the fear of it. Next time you go to lift something, there's a little subconscious reaction going on in your in your yeah. brain there. Uh oh, be careful, don't lift. Uh, you might get pain again, and then that actually can cause that neural circuit to turn on pain. Yeah. And so, and then it can enlarge not just to lifting, but to other stressful situations like being on rounds for a long time, standing up for a long time, sitting for a long time. Yeah. These can all become conditioned responses. And so the chance that, you know, you didn't, you may have a little muscle pull or something minor like that, but that healed. Yeah. And then what happened is the pain became chronic because those neural circuits got activated and then reinforced over time. It's so interesting looking back at that now with fresh eyes, with someone like you sitting in front of me. Because bit by bit, it became chronic and it would affect how I felt about myself. I would become fearful. Oh, I can't lift. I oh, know I can't help anyone. Move. I can't lift the sofa. And then again, the narrative, you know, you're six foot seven. You're really <laughs> tall. Of course, you're going to have back pain. But I actually, there was, there was a deep part within me, Howard, he thought, that's just nonsense, right? I do not have to be committed to a life of backache in my mid-twenties because I'm, you know, mega tall. I just refuse to accept that. I thought there's something going on here. I'm going to find the way to heal this. I'm not accepting that. Yeah. And I won't go into the whole story necessarily, but there's two particular things I wanted to share with you. One is that on this journey, I, like many people, spend a lot of money on different therapies because like, this is just, I can't play squash anymore. I can't sit for long periods of time. I can't drive for more than an hour. Like all this kind of stuff was, and for me, it was like, oh, it's because you're tall. You look at your posture, you look at all these things. And again, I'm not saying they have no value ever, but I found this guy, uh, it was a ski video, actually, this chap called Gary Ward, who I've written about. He's, a, he's, a, he's an incredible, incredible guy in terms of biomechanics. And I went to see him, I went to study with him. And he was basically saying to me that my right foot at the time was flat. And he said, Rangan, I don't feel your, and this is not exactly what he said word for yeah. word, but essentially that your right foot is stuck in pronation. It's not, uh, you know, I think we can help that right foot get better. He gave me some uh, five minute exercise to get my right foot going. And literally instantaneously, I felt relief in my uh, lower back. And that continued for years. So I could get back to squash. I could get back to long drives. I'd still have tightness. It, it would still come back from various times, but that made a huge difference. So I felt I got my quality of life back. But even though it was significantly better, 
it was still there. Sure. It was still come on at times of stress. I would notice. Yeah. Now, see, now you're getting to the, the heart of it. Now I'm getting to the heart of it because yeah. when I got the deep realization, so just a quick overview. When I was in second or third year at medical school, my dad became seriously ill with lupus. His kidneys failed. So he was 15 years on kidney dialysis. Mm. That's why I moved back in 2003 to the Northwest. That's why I live where I live today, because I was helping my mum and my brother look after dad for many years. Now, at my dad's funeral, in 2013. So, to contacts again, yeah. my back had been good for a few years. Like yeah. I'd been back to doing stuff, playing squash, back to the stuff I wanted to do in my life. But it, I'd still feel it. How I'd, I mean, this moment, like my dad was cremated and I can still remember wearing my suits at the end of the um, the service, I remember my dad's coffin. I could see it being brought out, and it went into the I, I don't know the official term, like the oven. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I saw the the door open. I saw the orange, yeah, the heat, the flames. And I am not kidding you, right? I can I, I can almost feel it now as I as I say it to you, as my dad's coffin went into the oven. I could feel my back ease off. Mm. And I was, I was like, I, I know that just happened. I wasn't thinking about it. It wasn't like I was planning for this to happen. And I thought about that. And I thought, oh my God, this is the, the weight of looking after my father I honestly felt, as I analyzed it afterwards, oh, wow. In that moment where you knew that dad was literally going to be gone, but because his yeah. body's about to be burnt, there is no more dad. Yeah. On some deep level, it was like, I knew I no longer need to care and take on that weight. Well, you had fulfilled your obligation. You came here to do what you needed to do. And it was a great gift to your father and your family. And it was a great gift to you as a son. And it was a beautiful thing. But it was a hard thing. And you did it for many years. And when at that moment you realize I've fulfilled my obligation, I've done it. And you can relax to that degree. And that's what happened in your back. Emotions matter. Emotions are real. We are psychological human beings. And the connections between emotions and our physical body are very real. These are neural circuits that get ingrained, get built in, get activated, get turned on and off. And um, I, I just think it's, it's, it's a beautiful process to understand because when we can understand that, we can understand ourselves and the people we love and care about. And as doctors, we can understand our patients and people can understand that the symptoms they're getting in their body sometimes are really just a message. They're a message from our brain telling us something, but we have to interpret it. And oftentimes, and this is really hard for some people to hear, but oftentimes they're a blessing in disguise. They're pointing us towards something that we need to do or we need to take care of. If you're in a situation in your life which is difficult and overwhelming, you need to change your job or change a spouse or change your relationship or set some boundaries or do something in your life, you may be having headaches or stomach pain or chest pain or back pain. Yeah. And you have no idea why, but if you look deeply and you are open to understanding these simple concepts, you can see it. And it's very real. To start off, I have to point out that Rongen's temporary and partial healing working with the man who specialized in biomechanics was clearly a placebo effect. His back pain had nothing to do with a flat or pronated foot, and it was his belief and respect for this man that allowed him to have such rapid results with these exercises. Many of us have had similar experiences only to find our symptoms returning or moving to other places in the body because the underlying and true causes were never addressed. Dr. Sarno once shared the insight that, 
These people are in pain because they are good people. This may seem strange, but will begin to make more sense as you continue learning about the phenomenon of TMS. The notion that our brain can create pain in order to protect us is something that recently came up while talking with a friend of mine. I realize that it is something that often needs more clarification. The aspect of ourselves that is creating pain and, quote unquote, protecting us is the aspect of the unconscious mind that could be considered the inner child. The inner child is not concerned with being good. The inner child is only concerned with our immediate needs. Needs for love, acceptance, protection, nurturance, and understanding. The inner child is not concerned with being a good son, brother, sister, father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, or anything else. It is only concerned with its immediate needs. When we are prioritizing the needs of others over ourselves, at some point this becomes a problem, and the inner child will throw a fit, using whatever it can to get our attention. Now, of course, Rongan loved his father and wanted to be there and help as much as possible, just as we all want to be there for our friends and family. But when this comes at the cost of ourselves too often, it can start to become a problem. This is where we have to start taking a look at whether or not we are taking good enough care of ourselves, so we can be of service to others. It is, of course, counterintuitive to think that someone's pain would go away at the passing of a loved one. But it is not the passing of the loved one that relieved the pain. It is the passing of the guilt and obligation. A very challenging aspect of my journey has been becoming honest with myself about what I can and cannot handle at a given time. This has involved the challenge of saying no even to friends and family. But what I am coming to find is that those that are closest to us want us to follow our hearts and do what we feel is right, even if it means that they have to be told no. This comes with the realization that at the end of the day we are each only responsible for our own happiness. My sister recently reminded me that we are better able to serve when our cups are overflowing. We are not able to serve when we ourselves are struggling just to get our heads above the water. If you found this to be meaningful, please like, share, and subscribe to support and encourage future creations of this kind. This content has been created with the sole intent of educating about, increasing awareness around, and deepening the understanding of the mind-body syndrome, and more broadly speaking, the mind-body-spirit connection. To hear this clip in its full context, please visit the original media source. And to learn more about the mind-body-spirit connection, you can visit howtosayfupolitely.com. Until next time, love your struggle and remain free.